Hello everyone, and thanks for joining me today. So normally, I stick uh, stitch diagonal parking. If you've watched other, my other videos, you've seen that. Um, I'm kind of doing more of a column style here because of the way the colors are going with this pattern. So it's the stone pillars, and you can see the colors are going quite in quite vertical direction. So as I just follow the colors, that's kind of what happened naturally. So, but as I'm still not closing stuff in as much as possible, still consider it the same method, just in a slightly different direction. Yeah, and rather, I mean, I could have stuck to going to diagonals, but I found since a lot of the colors are, you know, a whole bunch in a row or a column at once, then it kind of just went faster to sort of follow that direction rather than changing uh, colors as often. So, because yeah, the last few days I've been able to get over uh, 600 stitches done in a day when normally I get about, you know, 400. And I think if I was kind of forcing myself to stay with the uh, diagonal direction, then I would end up with probably, you know, only about 400 instead of being able to do 600. So, yeah. I mean, I've said speed isn't my main goal, but hey, if it does go faster, why not? Because, yeah, I have a lot of projects I want to do and, you know, we only have so much time. Yeah, I don't know how many I'll get done today. It's a bit of a busier morning. Have to get some groceries and do a bunch of laundry and uh, make some banana bread because I had some bananas that were going begging. So yeah, it's funny. I saw a meme saying that you know you never make banana bread, but actually I make it fairly often. I buy bananas for my son's school lunches and he doesn't always eat all of them. Got to do something with them, so. Yeah, and he does not like his bananas to be too ripe. He likes them quite green. I buy the greenest ones I can find and I'll think these are just too, you know, unripe. He's not going to eat them, but he will. <laughs> Even when they're solid green, he doesn't like them when they're ripe. I think because they are uh, mushier and he really doesn't like mushy stuff. So he will eat, uh, raw vegetables just fine. But, uh, if I cook them in soup, he doesn't like them. He says they're too mushy. So the texture is really important to him, which I get. I'm that way too. Yeah. So <clears throat> takes me three bananas to make a loaf of banana bread. And uh, if I don't have enough, I just um, freeze them and then wait till I have enough. So like I had two fresh bananas on my counter and I had a third one in the freezer. So that worked out perfectly <laughs> to make the uh, banana bread. Yeah, it kind of works out nicely in my family too. I, um, I don't really like the end pieces and my husband and son both love them. So when we split stuff up, it works perfectly. They each get an end and I get the middle. Everyone's happy. I don't know, I guess they like the chewiness of it. Like this, they're the same with brownies too. They like the outer pieces more than the, uh, the inner ones. Yeah, it's funny, when I was a kid and going to birthday parties, you know, kids were always fighting over, they wanted the piece with the, the roses on it, the icing roses on it, or they wanted a corner piece because it had extra icing. And I'm actually not a fan of icing. So I was the kid who was like, you can give me that one, which had the least amount of icing on it. And parents were always surprised, but it's too sweet. I don't like too sweet. Often I will just eat the cake and leave the icing on the plate, give it to my husband to finish. 
if he wants it, because he loves it, so. Yeah, I like sweets, but they can't be too cloyingly sweet. So there needs to be a balance. Although I'm more of a savories person, like, do you want to eat this cake, me? Eh, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But do you want to eat this giant bag of chips? Oh, give them to me, I'll, I'll eat them all. <laughs> yeah, I generally crave the, uh, the savory foods. I'm the person who goes this, to the store because they were craving sauerkraut. Like who craves sauerkraut, right? But I do, or pickled beets. Pickles. Oh, yeah. I could eat a whole jar of them. <laughs> I like sweet pickles if they're not too sweet. Yeah. I like pickled stuff. Yeah, I've made my own pickles before, actually. I was so sad, though, one time. I went to go and get a new jar of jam because I make homemade jam. And, uh, I saw a jar of pickles I made and sort of half the liquid was gone. And I was looking at it thinking, well, it should have liquid, you know, sort of right up to where the um, <clears throat> the neck of the jar is for the correct headspace. Why is it? And then I poked at the, uh, the lid and it just went bing, and came right off. And I was like, oh, that's why the seal failed after I put it on the shelf. Oh, I was so heartbroken. So I had to throw it all away because, you know, you don't know if it's safe anymore. And if you know, so much of the liquid had evaporated, then it was probably open for quite a long time. In fact, I'm guessing it probably unsealed within a day or two of putting her on the shelf. So yeah, unfortunately, that does happen. But I said, no, not homemade pickles. <sighs> but that's one reason why you're supposed to store your jars of preserves without the rings on. Because that way, if there's a seal failure, you will know. Because the problem is sometimes you're wrestling that ring off. You don't know if you popped the seal just now or if it had been popped for weeks before. And so you could end up, you right, with the dangerous food. So you don't want to mess around with botulism, that's for sure. Yeah, I always tell people, just because a jar is sealed does not mean it's safe if you didn't process it correctly. You have no idea if there's dangerous spores or bacteria in that jar. Because yeah, a lot of people, they say, oh, you know, my grandma, she always did it like this and it's been fine. Well, she's been lucky. A lot of our grandparents smoked too regularly and we all know that's not healthy for you. So, you know, or rode around in cars with no seat belts. Well, that wasn't safe either. They just got lucky that they didn't die. <clears throat> So yeah, I know I probably annoy people, but it's just, don't take chances. There was someone I know who got botulism poisoning. It wasn't from jarred food. I'm not sure where they got it, but they did. They had to spend like three days on a ventilator. So like fortunately they recovered, but it could have just as easily been fatal. It's yeah, not something to mess around with. And you can't always tell from smelling or tasting it whether it's gone off or not. So, yeah. Use correct techniques every time. Don't take that risk. Okay, let's see if I have a short piece here. So, yeah, and then I have people like, you canned meat? Well, yes, but I have a pressure canner. So, if you do it properly, I have people, oh, well, isn't that dangerous? It could blow up? Well, yeah if you did it wrong, but I mean, a steak knife is also dangerous if you use it wrong, right? Yeah. You know, one of those, uh, those mandolin cutters is dangerous if you don't use it correctly, so, yeah. In fact, the only time I've heard of exploding pressure cookers was because people tried to cook something that foamed up and blocked the vent, like split peas. That's what happened to my grandma. She was trying to cook split pea soup and they expand, you know, as they rehydrate and then they foam up and block it. And then, yeah, if, if no steam or pressure can escape, then kaboom. 
So I have never cooked split peas in mine, that's for sure. Actually, not a big fan of split peas. They're very, um, I don't even know how you'd describe it. Muddy, almost, the texture and taste to me. I don't know. It could be a genetic thing because I, I have that gene where cilantro tastes like soap. And uh, soap and dirt to me. And so does asparagus. And I'm wondering if it's related because I always wondered how can people like asparagus? It tastes like soil. Well, maybe it doesn't taste like soil to everybody. Maybe it's just me. Yeah, there's a few like avocados taste like dirt as well or grass to me. So it's probably the same gene, I would guess, that causes that. So yeah, it's kind of fascinating how we can perceive different things, the same thing differently. I remember um, when we were studying genetics when I was in high school and they had this uh, paper, little strips of paper that had the chemical on it and it was genetic whether you could taste anything or not. And the people who could taste it said it was absolutely disgusting. I couldn't taste anything. Just tasted like a piece of paper. So <laughs> I obviously didn't have that gene. Oh, yeah, it's kind of fascinating. Like I didn't know, not everybody can do this with their thumb. I have the hitchhiker's thumb. My husband can only go straight, mine's like that. So actually this kind of creeps him out when I do it. <laughs> So you shouldn't be able to bend that far. Yeah, I think I have the uh, EDS, that collagen disorder. Yeah, where your joints are looser. Because yeah, I've always been able to sort of bend into weird positions. I never thought anything of it when I was a kid because uh, my mom is the same way. So we would both W sit, kind of, but not on the floor. Like we'd have our feet would be like sort of out like this like a ballerina and our knees up like that and then holding onto our knees and I'd have people like how do you get in that position I'm like what do you mean because I always seen my mom sit that way so to me it wasn't weird I didn't realize that it wasn't a normal thing your joints could be able to do yeah fortunately yeah it causes problems I gotta be very very careful to not uh, mess things up like, if I try to open a jar that's too tight, I can really mess up my fingers. The joints don't want to remain where they should be. So, yeah, I got to I gotta watch it. Okay, yeah, I was the kid when we went to Science World and they had to do that, you know, test of how far can you bend over to, uh, on the machine. And I was the one who could go all the way to the wall. <laughs> freaked everybody out. It was like, what? Again, I thought it was normal because that's how my mom is. Lots of flexible nowadays. I should exercise more, but I have to be careful not to, you know, stretch too far because I could hurt myself. And jogging's not really good for me either because of the pressure on the joints. Knees and ankles will hurt if I do that, so. I mostly do biking or walking for my exercise. It's low impact and yeah, nicer on the joints. Also, I'm on a medication that gives me shortness of breath. So yeah, running is really not my thing. <laughs> oh, I'm mostly used to it if I'm like at rest. Every now and then I sort of have to take like a catch up breath, I call it. But um. One year, we went sledding and just walking back up the hill, I was totally winded. And I thought, what the heck? I'm not that out of breath or out of shape. But, oh, it was because, yeah, darn medication. Yeah. Unfortunately, with a lot of medications, it's which side effects do you hate the least? <clears throat> okay, let's see how long of a piece I need. All right, there's fair amount of this color, so I'll get a new piece. Right. Mm. 
Yeah, so no more zeros on this pattern yet. Only one so far. But yeah, I'm gonna only have uh, three columns left here and I'll have reached the outer edge. And then it'll be time to start another pass where I'll have probably some more vertical stitching because of course there's columns on the other side too. So yeah, that's just kind of what happens naturally. Yeah, again, a lot of purple here, but when you back up, it looks right. Gives it a nice shading. Yeah, it was like I was saying earlier about the um, perceiving things different ways, and they said that um, colors, because of course some people are colorblind, right? But even among people who aren't colorblind can perceive colors differently. So there was a meme that said color is a... Uh, pigment of your imagination instead of figment and then said sorry I'll see myself out <laughs> um, or I heard a theory that gray grays are actually colors that we can't see so that was kind of mind blown I wonder if that's true yeah because I mean there are other you know animals that can see more colors than we can But uh, visible light, I remember on um science show when I was a kid that they said if visible light or if light is a spectrum of, say, piano keys, 88 piano keys, how much can we see? And they said we can see the equivalent of one key in the middle. So, uh, yeah, there is a lot we can't see, which form things like UV rays and stuff, right? Okay. So as you can see, it just sort of, <laughs> the color just sort of keeps going down this sort of two column wide area. And then I'll go back to the top and carry down again. It just goes faster because this way I'm only switching between, you know, two or three colors. So that goes a little quicker, which is nice. Things went a lot slower. I was doing like the tree leaves and branches. Those were very intricate. So I'm thinking the bottom part of this pattern may go a little faster because there's more stones and such and not as much. Even the, um, the hedges that have flowers on them are not quite as many. So we'll see whether it goes faster or slower. So I wonder when they're going to send the street cleaners out. We're at the point now where most of the snow is <laughs> melted. It's just, now there's just piles of the dirt left behind from when they sanded to give you uh, traction. So yeah, once the snow melts, that uh, sand actually um, reduces your traction, I've found. And, you know, in the prairies we get the winds and it blows it everywhere and makes a mess. So yeah. They don't plow much here, but they do have the street cleaners. Yeah, when it comes to snow and ice, you're mostly on your own. <laughs> they don't plow a lot. I've gone years where they haven't plowed my street at all. Since we're near a school, but not on the bus route. So yeah, the bus routes get, the highways and the bus routes get cleared. Everything else is sort of on a need to basis and they, often decide we don't need to. So yeah, I kind of laugh at my relatives in BC where they don't get snow as often. And they're like, oh my gosh, they haven't, you know, plowed my road for three days. I'm like, ha ha, they haven't plowed my street for three years. <laughs> but then, as my brother-in-law pointed out, they have hills. True. Yeah. Yeah, 
we don't have much in the way of that. The few sledding hills we do have around here were artificially constructed when they were um, clearing lots for uh, houses and stuff and had extra, you know, fill for where they're putting the, um, the basements. All that dirt had to go somewhere, so yeah, they'll put it in a park or at a school and make a make a sledding hill. Yeah, cause we actually have basements here. I know in some places I have friends who say they don't really have it because uh, it's definitely nice because it gets really hot in the summer here, so there are times we go sleep in the basement instead. Yeah, when my son was a baby and I, he was downstairs too because it was hot. And then in the morning when he woke up, you know, we'd bring him into our bed for a little bit of extra rest while we kind of woke up. And uh, I remember bringing him into, we were just sleeping on the mattress on the floor downstairs, our spare one. And uh, we brought him in and he's sort of looking up at the ceiling like, this isn't your bedroom. <laughs> because, yeah. Was exposed to beams and stuff because it's not a finished basement. My goodness, ooh, my guinea pig is uh, chattering her teeth at me. Ooh, it's an awful sound. I don't like it at all. Okay, there you go. Dig in your hay. It sounds like uh, one of my neighbors is a. Uh, clearing a little bit of residual ice. Yeah, if the sun doesn't hit it, then it takes a lot longer to uh, to melt. In fact, during the spring thaw, um, one side of the street will, uh, will uh, lose their snow faster than the other because of the, you know, the way the sun slants. So we're one of the ones that, uh, yeah, our yard is uh, shaded by our roof most of the day so ours seems to take absolutely forever to melt our neighbors will be having green grass and we've still got snow on our lawn <laughs> and sometimes my husband will get sick of it and shovel it over to the part where it is exposed to the sun so that it'll melt a little faster or even put it into the gutter the rain gutter on the street so that it'll melt yeah i have one neighbor who will actually take his snow blower through it but like on the grass to break it up and I just think that can't be good for your lawn and honestly when he does that it doesn't really seem to um to melt that much faster than ours does a lot of times we just leave it and it seems to kind of melt the boat the same yeah chucking it in the sun the sunny part is really the only thing that works Yeah, we're still getting calls for little sprinkles of snow. Whoops, pulled that grid line loose there. But uh, fortunately, it's all above freezing, so none of it's going to stick. It'll just melt. That's just fine by me. Yeah, they said, though, the one benefit, when it's all snowy, all the potholes are filled. <laughs> Once it melts, yeah, they become very apparent. My son actually, when he was little, drew a picture and he drew the road like <laughs> this big wavy line. He's, yeah, he's used to us bumping around on the potholes no matter how much you try to avoid them or not go too fast. Yeah, they said in, in England they drive on the left. In Canada we drive on what's left. Because, uh, yeah, with our extreme um, temperature ranges, there's really no concrete mix that is built for both that high of heat and that much of cold so yeah they do a lot of patching not really much else they can do maybe one day they'll be able to invent a road material that can withstand it better and of course plowing doesn't help either right so yeah i remember when i was a kid and we went traveling 
in the US and I was so shocked that the um, the lane lines had those little like buttons on them, the reflectors, because of course up here we can't have them. They'll just plow them right off. But of course this was, you know, like down in California and stuff where it's not gonna snow. So they can have those. Yeah, I went to Disneyland. Actually, I went a couple of times. I went once when I was like in grade three, our family went. And then um, when I was in high school, I actually was in tour band. I played the flute and we went to Disneyland and we got to go to this uh, really neat workshop where we got to see what it was like to, um, to record a soundtrack. So it's pretty cool because of course, like they said, the, um, the music doesn't always go at a consistent beat, right? Sometimes it swells and goes faster. Sometimes it slows down depending on, you know, the emotion and such that they're trying to evoke. And obviously everybody needs to be playing together or it's going to sound horrible. And so how they do that is the conductor has what they call a click track in his headphones. And so it gives the beat, um, slowing it or speeding it up to go with the scene. It's been determined by people, right? That how fast the music has that they've written has to go at certain parts. And so you have to watch him very closely to follow the beat so that it, you know, it works together. And, uh, so we got to do a workshop where we got to do that. Um, we got to play a scene for, from Beauty and the Beast, the animated one, of course. This was in the 90s. Um, the, um, the ballroom scene. And uh, so, yeah, he, uh, the conductor got the uh, headphone on with the click track and we followed him. And it was harder to do because, of course, we didn't know the piece. We were sight reading. So it was very challenging because you're having to sight read the piece and try to keep your eye on the conductor to make sure you're following the beat because it's not going to be consistent. I don't think we made it through the whole piece. There was a part where the music really changed tempo and really swelled up or whatever. And uh, every time we got to that part, we fell apart. So we tried it about three times and we, we couldn't get it. But anyway, they, um, they took what we did do and then they showed us it playing with the film. The part that we did manage to get was... Yeah, it was a really interesting experience. Probably one of the most unique I've ever been through. Really enjoyed it. I actually considered um, potentially pursuing a career in um, doing movie soundtracks as a musician. Ended up not doing it, but yeah, kind of thought that'd be, that'd be a really neat job. And it's kind of funny because my husband... Um, He's an engineer and he does know how to do mixing boards and stuff. So he's like, hey, maybe we would have met anyway. You know, maybe I would have ended up working on movie soundtracks and we would have met anyway. So, yeah. Ooh. But yeah, I always love dissecting movie soundtracks and stuff. I remember when we watched um, Battlestar Galactica on Blu-ray and on the special features, of course, they were talking about the soundtracks and they said at the end, they had this one and it was the same track, but the guy played it a hundred times over and looped them together so that it, even though it was the same notes on the same instrument, it made this really rich, full sound of it. It was so cool. Yeah. I was like, wow, I never would have guessed he had a hundred tracks laid on top of each other like that, but yeah, he did. Well, I mean, it was very intense, that scene that they were talking about, and uh, it worked. Okay, this is a short piece, so I'm going to carry this one up over here to the right, because it's really only long enough to do, like, one more stitch. Yeah, so that's what I'm going to do, and I'll start a new piece for the other ones lower down when I get to them. So, that is why I decided to do that. So, yeah. I played the piano and I played flute for a while. I still have my flute, but I haven't played it in a long, long time. Piano, I play more. Yeah, my husband was never in band. He took something else. My son was for a few years. He was, uh, he played the uh, baritone or euphonium, it's like a smaller tuba. Yeah. 
So we did that for a few years, but getting into practice was like pulling teeth. And he was really only staying it because he liked to go on the band trips. And I said, well, you know, we can go on day trips. You know, you don't have to uh, join the band to go on day trips somewhere. So, And I said he was quite lucky because the last year that he was in band and that we went on a band trip was the beginning of 2020. Uh, and we went on the band trip and then I think maybe the next week was when everything went into lockdown. So I said, gee, you know, you almost missed your band. The whole reason you wanted to stay in band, you almost missed the trip entirely. So, yeah, I have a picture of that. I went as one of the chaperones on the trip. So I have a picture of uh, me and my son sitting there on the bus, the group bus to go to... Uh, and um said yeah that was the uh, the last normal thing we did you know we'd been hearing about covid then but you know it's we weren't quite taking it as seriously as we probably should have at that point right yeah because that was march very beginning of march of 2020 Yeah, and there's a picture of us and somebody I posted, I said, wow, this was the last normal thing we did. And of course, no masks because nobody was wearing them then. And one of my friends says, oh my gosh, your face is naked. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I said, you know, that's going to be when our kids are grandparents, that's going to be their, um, we went uphill in the snow both ways story, right? Yeah, we had to do learning online. All of a sudden, we couldn't go anywhere. We had to stay at home. It's kind of nice, though, when I, that, you know, you have Google Classroom online. The kids don't have to carry as many textbooks. Pretty sure I wrecked my back. I remember they're always telling you not to overload your backpack, but I mean... Each textbook weighed like, you know, three pounds and you had to bring like four of them home for homework every night or something. Like, well, what are we supposed to do? You know, teleport them home? They got to get home somehow. And if, you know, you take the bus and maybe you have to walk home from the bus stop, you got to carry it a fair ways. Yeah, because for a couple of years, my sister and I didn't live in the busing area for our, our high school. So um, we had to take the city bus. So yeah, we would have to walk, you know, at least three, four blocks home. With these heavy, heavy backpacks. Yeah, we were latchkey kids, like so many kids of our generation. When I um, when I met my now husband, I was still riding public transit because that's how I got to work. And uh, they'd oh, it's not safe. And I'm like, dude, you know, I've been riding public transit since I was 13. I'm good, you know. I can handle it. Yeah, I'm kind of on the cusp between uh, Gen X and Millennial. Depends on what um, what generational chart you're you're looking at. My parents are definitely Boomer generation, so I mean, most people would consider me Gen X since I'm their kid. But uh, yeah, depending, I'm sort of born right at the edge of where they draw that line, and it's you know not an exact science either, so. Yeah, I kind of relate to stuff from both. I'm an elder millennial, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I'm 40, so. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, they said we're kind of in that, or there's even some that call it, have a mini generation called the Xennial or whatever, because we sort of have traits from both the Gen X and the Millennial. We remember what it was like before all the technology and yet are young enough to understand the technology. Because yeah, we grew up in the early days of the internet, but smartphones aren't that new to us either. But I'm older than Google. Yeah, Google's only been around since 1998. I told that to my kids, like, really? Because, yeah, to him, it's always been around. I said, oh, yeah, uh, a conversational starter sometimes was, um, what's your favorite search engine? You know, now nobody uses anything else. Hardly ever, right? But, um, yeah, there was Metacrawler. There was Ask Jeeves. There was, you know, all sorts of different ones. And there was even the Boolean search where you had to use, you know, this, not this, this, and this, this near that. Yeah. Almost programming language to have to um, search for stuff. And sometimes some of the results you got were just absolutely bizarre. I mean, that still happens, but not as much. Google's pretty good at curating the uh, results. The stuff that is actually relevant. It was actually wild. I saw one where somebody had just typed into the search engine song and then wah, 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 da, da. And it actually found what song that was. Like, or, you know, who painted them melty clocks? And it can answer you. So, yeah, I remember my husband having difficulty because he was searching for a computer part called a PROM. But of course, if you type in PROM, it was bringing up prom stuff, you know, prom dresses and, and things. And he's like, how am I gonna find that? I said, well, you have to type in like PROM and then type in like computer or engineering or, you know, not, you know, not graduation to find the right stuff. I have no idea what a PROM is, so don't ask me. I just know he was having difficulty finding the parts he wanted to order. Yeah, I don't know what most of the stuff he uses is. I tried taking computer programming in high school because, hey, they said there's a lot of uh, careers in that, but yeah, my brain does not work that way. <laughs> my brain is more the artistic side than that side, so... Oh, that's all right. Life would be boring if we're all the same, right? Takes all kinds to make things work. Yeah, my husband said he wouldn't mind a job in R&D, research and development. That would be kind of his jam. He works in mostly uh, communications which is also important. And even for a hobby, he does the uh, amateur ham radio. We have a tower in our backyard, so. Yeah, he's uh, one of the younger guys doing it. It's mostly older, you know, retired guys who do it. So he's one of the younger. There's a few guys younger than him. Like some of the members there, their sons are also into it, or even grandsons, but... Uh, yeah. So yeah, you're allowed to have a tower in your yard because if there's a disaster, basically having a license is kind of a contract that if there's a disaster and, you know, communications are down, you will be part of that um, communication chain. So that's sort of the, um, the payoff to being allowed to have a radio tower on your property is that, yeah. If a uh, disaster hits, you got to step up and help out. So, yeah, kind of interesting. And our son kind of uh, learned a bit of it too. He doesn't have his license or anything. He was just kind of went along to some of the classes and learned some about it. My husband actually taught some of them, so. Yeah, he, um, 
He said he wouldn't have minded being a teacher, but being a teacher is not easy, right? You have to go through so much um, education and they really don't want to pay you what your work is worth, which they really should. I've often said teachers are not appreciated the way they should be. But yeah, a lot of people have said that he's very good at finding ways to um, demonstrate and explain things that makes them understandable when other people couldn't. So yeah, it actually was kind of fun. He went through and we went to the craft store and bought some stuff so he could make props to really explain what he's talking about with visual aid. So I can't remember what it was he was explaining, but he got a piece of tubing and some big wooden beads to go through it to demonstrate something. I don't know what, but yeah. But then, yeah, that was kind of fun because I could help him design that stuff. Okay, what are you going for? Okay, and then I could help him figure out how we could make it work. Yeah, he gets to have a special license plate on his um, on his personal vehicle as well. That is his, um, his ham radio tag. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, that vehicle he has is actually a uh, right-hand drive. Because here in Canada, of course, we're left-hand drive vehicles. So that was an import somebody had from a long time ago. So yeah, if we, uh, if we travel in that one, we get quite a few looks. Because I'll be sitting there knitting and it looks like I'm in the driver's seat, right? You get a lot of double takes. Or when our son was littler and he would be sitting in what looks like the driver's seat, he's you know, seven or eight years old, people will double, you know, uh, doing, uh, uh, taking a second look because uh, it's like, wait a minute, is that kid driving? <laughs> yeah, it was from Japan. Actually has a little curb mirror on one side too. Of course, the opposite side of where our curbs are because it's from where they drive on the other side. But uh, yeah. And so, yeah, once we got it, my son, he likes to make little Lego cars and he started adding little curb mir mirrors to all his uh, all his cars because he really liked that car, the Trooper. It's the Isuzu Trooper. I don't think they make those anymore. Yeah, the only drawback is it's a diesel, so when it's really cold, it won't start. You can only really use it in the summer, fall, kind of. Oh, let's see if I can get this out. Nope, it came off the needle. That is okay. We're actually almost at the bottom here, and then we'll just head right back up to the top. So yeah, that's sort of how my stitching has been going the last few days. Because the colors have just been kind of going that way. So normally, I, um, I back up my work when I get to the bottom of a diagonal. And now I've just been kind of backing it up every day. Because it's kind of hard to tell where. Because usually bottom of a diagonal is about, you know, 600 stitches. So as I've been doing about, like I said, 600 stitches a day, I now just back it up after that. Yeah, the pattern keeper saves locally on your tablet, but the backup is nice just in case uh, anything were to happen to it. Your progress would be, would be able to import it onto a new tablet. Or if you had more than one device that you can stitch from, because it doesn't automatically sync because it doesn't have its own cloud you have to use like google drive or dropbox or something or even email it to yourself as your backup i've had people say oh why can't it sync but i'm like in order to it to be able to sync that means the designer has to have a cloud their own cloud service and that's quite a lot of storage and this is just you know a little independent designer made this and they made it so you can export so it's not that much more work Especially, um, you have the option to export the entire PDF or just a Pattern Keeper file that can only be read by Pattern Keeper. And that one takes, honestly, like 
five seconds to back up. So I don't really think it's that much work. Okay, yeah, I thought that was a short one, so that works out just right. Oh, where did I put my scissors? Ah. All right, let's see if this one is enough or not. It's gonna cut it close. But I think it will be just enough. Okay, woohoo. Mm. No, I have a feeling that didn't come up quite right. I'm gonna go the other way because it's, yeah. I don't know why, it just doesn't want to go correctly, so. Tuck these out of the way, my grind guard, and then head back up to the top. Let's see where it makes sense to continue from. Okay, so I'm going to have two threads of this color I can see right now because I don't want to cross back and forth. It just kind of runs in two columns, so we will do them as two separate columns. I think this one was just a very short piece, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, just enough for that one stitch.
was already threaded. See where the column ends here. Just a couple more stitches over from where I'm working. And then it's sort of less of a, because of course that's the stuff that's sort of in the background behind the pillars. It's less of a vertical style. So you can see it's kind of converting into, I'll be back into the sort of more diagonal style in that area once I get to it. Be careful because I leave a little slack in my grid lines here so that they don't pull and distort the holes. You have to be careful also to make sure they haven't pulled loose and you're, you know, you think your grid line is down a roll off from where it should be. I had that the other day, couldn't figure out where I'd miscounted and then realized, oh, my grid line shifted. That's why everything was a stitch off. Fortunately, I discovered that before I had undone and fixed a bunch of stuff. So yeah, sometimes I just have to go and pull the grid line taut again to make sure I'm in the right place. How long is this? Oh, still a fairly, fairly good length. If I can get it free, there we go. So I'll park this one down to the right. <laughs> so now, as you can see, the colors sort of to keep from closing and I have to keep going over to the right, so I'm going to go back up to the top. Yeah, that's just sort of what makes sense to keep from closing stuff in.
top again. Join another thread like I said I was gonna. Oh, pardon me. Yeah, once again, not a great night's sleep. It's uh, the anxiety of knowing I only have a limited time to sleep keeps me awake. It's very frustrating because, like, on the weekends. I don't really sleep that much later, but because I know I don't have a set time to get up, I can get up when I'm ready to, I can sleep all the way through instead of, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night, like three, four to use the bathroom. And then lovely anxiety brain says, well, what if you can't get back to sleep? You've only got, you know, X number of hours left, which of course means then most of the time I don't get back to sleep for a while. I'll lie awake for another hour or two, even though I'm really tired, so... Ugh. Anxiety sucks. <laughs> As someone said, anxiety is like, um, you know, if you're playing a game and you hear the um, the battle music start, but you don't see any enemies? I said, that's what it's like all the time. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Or they said, you know when you're, um, you're walking on the stairs and you think there's one more stair and there isn't, you almost do a face plant? Yeah, it feels like that, but like, all the time. Ugh. And... Being mostly logical and having, like, anxiety is just, yeah, it's a bit of a trip. Like, I know I'm not being rational, thank you. But it doesn't mean I can just stop, you know, thinking it. I know the what-ifs are not a good, healthy thing, but unfortunately, knowing that rationally doesn't mean, doesn't translate to, uh, to no longer having them. It'd be sure nice if it did. Oh, well you're gonna do home stretch with that color, 224. There was a lot of it in the middle of the pattern. The, uh, the sky. But now we've done most of that rosy part of the sky, so. Okay, so I'm thinking I'm gonna put this aside for a while back to it later. Right, yeah, I went further over to the right because I needed to get this, these colors done. is just long enough to consider saving so I will if it turns out it's too short which I don't think it is I can always chuck it away later whoops just trying to move while I was still in search mode 
that won't work. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make it possible to do all those um, hollow heart stitches. It's sort of one go. So fill in this number three stitch that's to the left of that one. Park it. That means then fill in this checkerboard stitch. Just checking the grid line because it's kind of wonky. It happens sort of out here at the edge. But yeah, I did once where I did the grid line and sort of just went back instead of attaching them to the sides without any slack and it kind of distorted the holes at the edges of the piece and I didn't like that. So yeah, I'd rather put up with a little trouble from the slack than distort my piece because that distortion would last I wouldn't want it to be noticeable. There. So I did that so that I can do those three stitches at once and then park it. So those other stitches kind of had to be done one by one anyway. And then this way, after I've done them, I can do these three all at once. Okay, and Having trouble grabbing just one strand to pull it free. Good. It's just a loop and not a knot. So I was able to untangle it. Perfect. Go. All right, I think I'm gonna call it a day there because I gotta go and switch my laundry over now that my uh, washing machine has completed its cycle. So uh, thanks for joining me today and uh, I hope to see you here again next time. All right, thanks everyone, bye.